Hey, Tommy, did you know that in Colorado today we reached a dubious, dubious record? Oh, yeah? What was the record? Uh, we topped $4 a gallon, the highest ever in the state. For milk? No, for gas. <laughs> and if we're at four, you got to figure that California is at least five. Yeah. Uh, and diesel, for some reason, is even a dollar more than that. So are we going to get to the point where a gallon of gas is more than a gallon of milk? We're there. Oh, already? Yeah, we're there, for well, sure. Well, but we're not quite at, like, Whole Foods, double organic, vitamin D-infused milk levels yet. No, no, that that's a ways away. <laughs> <laughs> but in this uh, video slash podcast, we're going to be talking about the most fuel-efficient cars, mm. maybe even the least fuel-efficient cars you can buy. So if you're out there and you're looking to maybe upgrade to a more economical vehicle, uh, then we're going to tell you which ones those are. And... Jay has put together not just that list, isn't that right, but the ones that are fun to drive, Jay. Oh yeah, we got a complete list of cars that are actually fuel efficient and you want to be seen in. You'll have a good time driving. So this is going to be a short podcast because I have the answer right now. Miata? Nope. <laughs> okay, what's the answer? Okay. No, there's only one correct answer to this question. The Toyota Prius. <laughs> actually, oh, we knew that was coming. Actually, you know, uh, it's funny. So I'm glad you brought that up, Tom, because... Jay, you may not believe this, but I couldn't agree more with Tommy. We had the Prius here, what, like a month ago, maybe two months ago? Yep. Okay. Uh, and, you know, the Prius has, got, let's face it, gentlemen, the Prius has gotten a reputation for being uh, the poster child for no fun toaster to drive that's very fuel efficient, right? That's absolutely true. Right? It's like it's like what taxi cab drivers use in a lot of places. But I like the Prius. <laughs> Actually, I was really impressed by it, Tommy. Not only was it fun to drive, but there's an all-wheel drive version, which you can actually use in the winter. I just had this big argument. I've actually had this argument now, like three or four press trips in a row. So we go on these press trips, and then all the journalists have these dinners together, right? And you talk about cars, because that's what you do. Um, and I somehow always get on the topic of how much I genuinely love the Toyota Prius, and then everyone laughs at me and makes fun of me and says I'm a tall, skinny nerd, which is true. But I legitimately think the Prius is one of the best new cars you can buy on the market because it is extremely comfortable, very roomy, uh, quite affordable, and the amount of stuff you get for your money is off the charts. The one we had was a nightshade edition. It was like low $30,000 range, but it had good lane centering, adaptive cruise control, wireless charging, heated seats. Um, it had fantastic Apple CarPlay. It was super roomy. The seats folded all the way down. You put your bike and the dog and everything in the back. It was wonderful. Yeah, all of the uh, safety equipment. And I drove the bejesus out of that car, driving it up a mountain, um, literally up a mountain really? from 5,000 to 12,000 feet. On the way back down, I measured the fuel economy on the way up and down. 52, 53 MPG. Wow, that's officially, uh, high, Toyota has it, or the EPA rather, has it rated at 58 city, 53 mm -hmm. highway. I hit the highway number. There yeah. you go. Driving up and down a mountain in, uh, in, in you know, Colorado's winter. It was a truly phenomenal car. Um, granted, mm. it's not cool. And there's nothing like very trendy now about driving a Prius, and certainly, uh, like you said, it does have a little bit of a reputation for being the go-to Uber car. But if you want a car that will last you a million years, get you 50 miles per gallon, um, and hold all your stuff and friends while doing it, uh, the Prius is the way forward. Yeah, so you know, Prius uh, invented the hybrid synergy drive, right? That's Toyota's terminology for combining electricity and gasoline. Well, it's interesting. Um, so we used to own one of the cars we'll talk about on the list probably, yeah. I'm hoping it's on here, mm -hmm. yeah. but the first-gen Honda Insight. Yes. And the Insight beat the Prius to the market like six months. in the U.S. Yeah. But I want to say in Japan, the Prius beat the Insight. Because remember, there was a generation of Prius we never got here in the States. It was a Japanese-only thing. But we're talking like mid to late 90s was the introduction of the hybrid synergy drive system. And ever since then, it's been slowly and slowly and slowly evolving. And now you can buy a big comfy car that'll get over 50 miles to the gallon, which is incredible. So, you know, the problem with the Prius is it just went through that kind of boom and bust cycle, right? So when it first came out, people were like, that's a weird little car. And then fuel prices got very expensive. Yep. Your, my wife, your mom bought one during that time, right? And the Prius just exploded and Toyota was like, hey, this we've got something here. We've got a you know tiger by the tail. So let's not just create one car, let's create a sub-brand called Prius, right? So then the Prius C came out, mm -hmm. right? There, there was the, 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 the big, tall, what was that one called, the big Prius, Tommy? The Prius V. The Prius V, yeah. Uh, and, and it became almost like overexposed, and 
it became too popular. You know, there's this kind of the saying, what, you know, burns red hot kind of dies quickly as well. And it just became too popular too fast. And then they became uh, a poster child for like all that's wrong with the car industry, right? Where you're building toasters that are fuel efficient, but are no fun to drive and have no, as Nathan would say, lead in the pencil. Well, you were not driving them right. <laughs> so I just had this big conversation with Sofian Bay, my buddy at Red Line Reviews. Yeah. You can, ha you can have a lot of fun in a Prius, but you got to change your mindset. It's not about acceleration and performance and cornering. It's about playing with the energy monitor, maximizing the coast, maximizing the time on battery, minimizing the time on gasoline. And if you look at it like that, uh, you're never going to get a speeding ticket. <laughs> and you also kind of have a, like a little fun game you can play with yourself. Um, now, I... Dare I say? Dare I say this, gentlemen? Let's go ahead. Uh, I think... Why that, do you keep going with the gentleman? I, I it's kind of like creeping it. me out here, Dad. Shall I say that? Hey, you guys. Shall I say this, guys? Well, it's just okay, like... Okay, like social media guys? It's just very formal to be hearing your dad yes. call you a gentleman. Well, you are. You're no longer 12. I am still 12 in spirit and heart here, Dad. Okay, <laughs> guys. Got a point, yeah. My voice hasn't dropped since I'm 12. And then to be called gentleman, whoo. Uh, okay, guys. <laughs> I'll go with that. Uh, I'm not uh, asking for dudes. You want me y'all? You want to do the southern thing? Sure, we can do y'all. That's all right. Fine. We'll go with y'all. Y'all, that's very, that's, of course, a y'all, not y'all. I feel like I'm at the Kentucky Derby over here. Because I say y'all? No, with the gentleman. All right, it doesn't matter. Here's the thing. Maybe with <laughs> gas prices going through the roof, uh, the Prius will have a renaissance. Maybe people will go back and discover all of the fun things that the Prius is and forget about all of that baggage that it's created over the last 20 years. Do you remember when, like, in 2004, everybody in the um, social celebrity spheres had to buy one? Remember everybody yeah, had remember. the... Yeah, you wore your greenness on your sleeve. You had a Prius, yeah. It, it was the one Larry that... Larry David had one, right? In Curb Your Enthusiasm. There was a sure. whole thing where people would, like, wave to each other. Yes, I know. But then, mm -hmm. And then um, celebrities had them. And then you had this weird dichotomy where we had sun celebrities and Priuses and other ones in excursions and and Escalades. Exactly. Um, and there was this kind of this like interesting little social dynamic. And then Priuses, I think, became really popular with the folks that cared about the environment. And now those folks have left the Prius and have now all bought Leafs. All right, hold on. Let, let me do some math. Well, we'll get to electric cars. Don't don't jump the gun here. Let me do some math while we're here, okay? So let's okay. say that you're averaging 50, how much? What's the, what's the Prius official EPA, 54 or something like that? Uh, the Prius? Yeah. It depends on the model. Exactly. Yeah. The pre yeah. All right, let me do some math. But just say, just say 54. I think that's a good Yeah, that's number. about right. All right, right yeah. so 54. And let's say it's got a, 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 a 10 gallon tank. I think that's, I think you have to use a calculator for that, right? I think it's like 12. All right, let's go 12, okay? Yeah. So 12 times 54 equals 648 miles of range on one tank. Yeah, they go a long way. 648. That, 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 that is lot. astounding. Yeah. So, so, so let's see how much that costs in real dollars here in Colorado. So, uh, let me clear it. 12 times, and the record is $4.01. So you're going to pay $48, mm -hmm. just under $50, to go 650 miles. Yeah, I mean, and I mean, that's... I mean, if you're looking for, you know, something to help you fight... And, and you don't have to get a new one, right? You, you can go out there. Easily can buy a secondhand yeah, one. Yeah, they're, they're, I mean, they built millions of these at this There's point. There's plenty of them available. I, I want to say last time I, I, I checked, it was well in the millions. And so they're out there. There's, what, four generations now? So I'm going to show you something really cool here. Okay. If you go to fueleconomy.gov, which yeah. is the official government website for uh, fuel economy numbers, yeah. um, something that not a lot of people know is, of course, you compare side by side, which is what I do constantly at this job. But my favorite thing to do is to actually, they, they give you the listed range. So let me uh, let me go ahead and find the right model here. Okay. So 2022 Toyota Prius. Yeah. I think the LE is the most efficient. Yes. Uh, or maybe it's called the Eco. It's been a little while since I've done the Prius. Um, so there's a bunch of different Priuses. There's a Prius, a Prius all-wheel drive, and a Prius Eco. So let's go ahead and ch check out the Eco. So uh, on, if you get the Eco, it's 56 combined, 53 city, 58 highway, and the EPA says 633 miles of range. Yeah, I, I, wow. so my numbers were pretty close. Yeah, they were pretty so close. You'll, you'll spend five, 50 bucks right now to go 650 miles. 11.3 gallon tank. I, I would bet. And that's at $4 a gallon, you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, still I, not bad. Look, I, would wait, I would wager that that's probably less money than a Leaf. Depend so okay, electric cars are hard. You can't pin them down, uh, and I'll give you a couple of rules of thumb, right? Mm -hmm. So these are just so, so in America we have a very decentralized grid, and so there are utilities that work 
across different states, across different cities, across different counties, right? So you can't just say like it, like the cost of gas or the cost of electricity is $4 in Colorado, whereas it's $6 in California. It doesn't work that way, right? It depends what utility you're using, what time of day you're filling up, right? So it, it's hard to do an apples to apples comparison. But there are some pretty good constants. First one, it, when you're public charging guys, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty much very similar to the cost of gasoline in terms of how much you're paying to get the same amount of range. Now, I'm not gonna do a kilowatt versus, because that's a very hard number to do as well, but what is, let's start with this basic number, what is the MPGE of the LEAF? Well, it's gonna be higher. Yeah, but let's, let's get that number. Because electric cars are much more efficient. It's so, so that's MPGE stands for miles per gallon equivalent. Here's the thing, though, Dad. Um, but let's let's just get that number out there, because you, you said the Leaf, right? You said all the people who are driving the Prius are now driving the Leaf. Well, not everybody, but, but you know what I mean. Folks. It's the same kind of like they they switched to the Leaf, and let's also be you know fair to the Leaf. It was the first public. Well, first mass-produced electric car. So I'm looking at the 22... Affordable. 22 Nissan Leaf, 62 kilowatt-hour battery pack, um, 215 miles of total range, and 104 MPGE. Wow, so double a, double a Prius. But here's the thing. What if I told you you don't have to do any math? Okay. Let the government do the math for you. Okay. Because if you look at the compare side-by-side -side on fueleconomy.gov, yep. uh, they have this little feature here that's based on you save or brilliant. you spend. That's brilliant. Yes, it's fantastic. Yeah. And uh, they, they base it off average vehicle consumption in 2022, which is apparently 27. And then it's even based off of, according to the website, 15,000 miles and current fuel prices. Okay. So here's where things get interesting. According to this little comparison chart, if you buy a new Prius Eco, you save six thousand two hundred and fifty dollars in fuel cost over five years compared to the average new vehicle. Okay. If you buy the Nissan Leaf, sixty-two kilowatt hour battery, you save eight thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars in fuel cost over five years compared to the average new vehicle. But they get even more exciting. They break it down on cost to drive twenty-five miles. Okay. So according to this uh, fueleconomy.gov website, uh, the Prius is going to cost you one dollar and ninety-three cents at current fuel prices to drive 25 miles. The Leaf is going to cost you $1.05, so it's a little bit more affordable. So so if I'm reading those numbers right, the Leaf is gonna be about 20% more cost efficient uh, in terms of energy use that you have to pay out of your pocket. But I think you brought it up, but yeah, yeah, you exactly. brought up an excellent point, a hugely important point. It really depends greatly on how you charge it up. If you live in a city in an apartment and you have to rely on uh, public DC fast charging, like Electrify America, to charge up your leaf, it's gonna be expensive, you're gonna have a pretty bad experience, I hate to say it overall, um, and you're just not gonna enjoy the car. If you live in a suburban environment and you have a place where you can charge it up in your garage, it's going to be extremely affordable, uh, very easy, um, and for most folks with average commutes, you're never gonna think about the fast charging network. All right, so let's do this, guys. So now that we've got that, let's compare those two cars, if possible, to the most popular car in America, which happens to be, drum roll, the RAV4. Hybrid or standard? Uh, the RAV4 sells almost 400,000 units. It actually surpassed the Accord and uh, the Camry as the most popular vehicle. So I would just go with standard. I mean, can we do a comparison with the standard one? Uh, sure, I'll do RAV4 sure. all the drive and then I'll do a hybrid. And, and of course, there's a hybrid and there's a prime, but I like to deal in vehicles today especially uh, that are gettable, right? And let's face it, the Prime is unobtainium. Well, so, so <laughs> I mean, the yeah. issue is a lot of these cars we're talking about today are I think be. you can buy a RAV4. You could probably go to a Toyota <laughs> dealership and get a RAV4. I think but, you might even struggle. But actually, I know a guy who's on a wait list for a hybrid. I mean, that's what I'm hybrid. saying, but I'm saying a RAV, just a regular RAV4. Yeah, The that, hybrid that's might be harder, doable. but let's just compare those numbers to a regular RAV4. I want to do a hybrid too. I all think right, it's going right. to be interesting. All right, do it, do, do it, and let's compare them. Let's see how much money you'd save over the cost of a year. Because as much as you know, we may like the Prius or we may like the Leaf, the fact is most Americans now are buying crossovers. Exactly. Okay, so I've got all-wheel drive to all-wheel drive. Okay. Um, so uh, I, I just chose the all-wheel drive RAV4 because here in Colorado everybody buys them. So um, the gasoline all-wheel drive RAV4 uh, with the 2.5-liter four-cylinder automatic and um, eight-speed looks like 
Uh, 29 MPG combined okay. on that model, 420 miles of total range, and you save $750 in fuel cost over five years compared to the average new vehicle. And that means that the cost to drive 25 miles on the RAV4 gas is $3.73. Wow, so wow. triple that of a Prius or a Relief. Yes, and then wow. I've got wow. the yep. hybrid. Wow, that's, that's, that's yeah. just to go up from a, a standard car to a crossover. There so it is. The hybrid all-wheel drive is rated at 40 in the RAV4. So 29 in the gas to 40, okay? On the gas model, you save 750 over four years, on the hi or five years. On the hybrid, you save 4,000. But how much does it cost to drive it a mile? No, no, 25 miles. 25 miles, sorry. $2.71. Double, double, there more than double. Yep. Wow, so now you're, you're doubling your... Well, it's not quite double because the, the Prius is $1.93. Okay, and how much was the Leaf? A dollar. So basically, by going from electric to hybrid to crossover, you're adding a dollar every one of those. Yeah, that's a great per, that's a, per 25 miles. I'm just more or less. That's about right. Yeah, I'm trying to within simplify. a few cents here. More so, or less. Which is you know when you so multiply that by 12,000, which is the average number of miles that a person drives a year usually. Well. Right, and then you're getting a big, a much bigger number. Well, it's 25 miles, not every mile. So 12,000 divided by 25. Right, is how much? Um, 480. Okay. But they do the math for you. Okay. So, it, I mean, annual fuel cost. Right. This is based off of uh, 15,000 miles driven every year. So they're going 15, wow. So the Prius, 1,150. Yeah. The Leaf, 650. Yeah. The standard RAV4, 2,250. The RAV4 Hybrid, 1,600. And then if you really, like, you, you could put that all in a spreadsheet and, and, you, and you can figure out where your break-even point is, right? Yes, right. sure. <laughs> exactly. And that's based on 45% highway, 55% driving, 15,000 annual miles in current fuel prices. There you go. So that very cool website. If you've never done the compare side-by-side -side on fueleconomy.gov, it'll change your world. Yeah, that, that, is, that is a very powerful analytical tool. Okay, well, should we start talking about some of the interesting... Um, Choices that, that Jay has lined up for us well, because well, yeah, exactly. I know yeah, you don't want to focus to on do. EVs, right? This is going to be more well, of a... We'll talk about EVs eventually because I think we need to talk about EVs, but I don't want to make this all about EVs okay. because that sound you're hearing is people like, you know, changing to uh, Spike's podcast. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and I like Spike. <laughs> so, um, Jay, yeah. what are some of the cars you have lined up for us? Well, the first one is the one we're looking at right now. So these are going to be fun to drive, exactly. fuel efficient vehicles. Exactly. And some people may not even realize that these cars like, are shockingly very fuel efficient, right, especially so on the highway. And the, right here, the Mazda Miata MX-5, specifically the club trim, it gets 25 miles per gallon in this city. I'm sorry. Yeah, 25 miles per gallon in the city, 42 highway, and a combined 34. So let's let's plug that into your little thing there. Let's just put it in there. I'm just curious. Should we compare it? I mean, can you add one more, or is that too many? That's too many. You got to delete something. Well, delete. Uh, let's delete the leaf. Get rid of compare the leaf. it to the to the Prius. Okay. Yeah, let's compare it to the Prius because we we don't want to mix electric and um, ice. Keep in mind, this is we've been using the Prius Eco. Look, here's the, uh, obviously, you know, I hate saying obvious things, but as much as but I like is. the Miata, it's a two-seater. It's a toy. It's, it's a toy. It's a fun yeah. car. It's a fun car, but if you're looking to, like, save, it, 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 I guess if you were very wealthy and you could afford a third car, then this would be the one you might want to drive to work and feel good about driving it because you're getting good fuel economy. But let's face it, you're not going to put the kids in it. You may put one dog in it. Maybe you're significant other but it's not going to be a practical car. You can't car. even get it like a right. decent sized suitcase in the truck. But don't worry, I have another two vehicles on this list that okay. solves those problems. Did you figure it out, Tommy? Mm. Are you at the Miata yet? Are you picking which one? Are you picking the Club Sport? Which one are you going for? It doesn't for? go that far, but it doesn't make a lot of sense either, the okay. results I'm getting. Uh oh, we found a problem with uh, yeah. fueleconomy.gov. Yeah, all right, Jay, keep going. I'll for okay. some reason, the Miata's the, no the Miata's thrown it all off here. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was gonna say I was. I think it's the Miata just threw off the algorithm. You're yeah, you're confused. You keep working at it. Honda oh. Civic Si. Yeah. So what's the fuel economy on the Honda Civic Si? This is. I was surprised at this one. Twenty-one in the city, forty-four on the highway, and a combined thirty-two. That's because it's only a manual, which is also exactly, a which is like, I mean, it's 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 a family car. Yeah, uh, it's bigger than the previous generation. It is front wheel drive only. So, I mean, if you live here in Colorado, they may not be the best choice. 
because all-wheel drive is very popular, but still. On, on the plus side, the Civic Si, or any Civic, has gotten big, right? It's like yes. an Accord from days Ten of years ago, yore. something like that, yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, so it's big, it's roomy, uh, you know, it's a classic... Uh, what, when I was a kid, big full size sedan, which today is it's weird. A, it's a, it's considered a, a compact. So, so Jay, you know my first car was a Honda uh, CVCC, this little tiny Honda that eventually became the Civic, right? You could oh, probably fit three of those, like a little hatchback type yeah, of a thing. Little hatchback. Yeah, hatchback. Probably light up three of them. Probably. Probably. Or but that, that definitely is, two. Definitely two. But for in 2022, that the Honda Civic Si, you're you're gonna do okay on fuel economy. And what's the uh, what's the combined number on that? Uh, the Civic Si is uh, 32. 32. Okay. So I did find a Civic. It's kind of tricky in the mobile app. I should have brought my computer here. But I'm looking at a Civic. Uh, I don't know if this is the, the Si or just a sport model, but it's right around 31 combined. Uh, yeah, 384 course. miles of total range, and that's going to cost you $2,100 a year to keep fueled up at current prices. I really actually do quite like the Civic Si a lot. Um, yeah. The new one is, is certainly a little bit more conservative in the styling department than the old one, but they've really upped the interior quality and the interior design, and that is one of the best parts about the new Civic. And it's got Honda Sensing, which is their full suite of autonomy features, and it's pretty good. Yeah, and then uh, other good news is if you're like a fan of uh, Acura, there's going to be an Integra. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly, which <laughs> is the, the, the local, same car. Which is the same car at the local dealership. Just, Acura just dealership. don't tell Acura that. They won't like to hear that. <laughs> Well, it is the same car. It is the same and it's car. always been the same. It's not like it's the same car. For the, you know, back in the day when the Integra first came out, it was always based on a Civic. I do think that the Civic SI is a little bit expensive for the power output. I think they should have probably, from an enthusiast standpoint, given it just a little bit more horsepower for the dollar. That would be kind of my one complaint about it. And I'm still not convinced that the rev hang thing is fixed over the previous generation. So these have this, this weird thing where when you go to shift between gears, you push it on the clutch and it takes a long time for the revs to decay, which can make it kind of tricky to go from gear to gear. But it's practical. It looks quite nice. Um, I do like some of the color options as well. The seats are very supportive. And I think that this is a winner, Jay. So I'm not totally on board with the MX-5 just because it is a little bit small and cramped. But right. I, will give, I will give a big nod to the Civic Si. Um, my issue with the Civic Si is an interesting one, I think. And that is, you know, when I was growing up, Tommy, if you wanted a fuel-efficient car, you would get a manual. But now that's been put on its head, right? Because automatics specifically... CVTs, if you count those as automatics, are much more fuel efficient uh, than manual cars. And in fact, manual cars are now some of the least efficient cars, which is weird because, like I said, when I was growing up, I felt like real special because I was like, hey, I know how to drive an auto. I know how to drive a manual. So not only am I special, but I'm saving fuel. <laughs> and now, of course, it's the opposite way. Yeah. But you would. But I am still special, Tom. And you don't like CVTs. No, I hate. CVTs. You have made those very clear yeah, in the sure. past. No, yeah, they're no fun. But this is a good choice, Jay. I think that yeah. the Civic Si is a great car for folks that want to maybe do an autocross, maybe go have some fun in the canyons, and still be able to hold friends and family. And it's affordable. And it looks quite good. I think the new design is quite nice. Okay. Although I will say, if you look at a 1987 Honda CRX HF, fuel economy is way higher on that. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, can I, can, I, um, can I do a little palate cleansing right now? Sure. A Roman rant, do you mind, Tommy? I just want to kind of talk to the enthusiast out there because we've been doing a lot of cars that if you're an enthusiast, you might find, shall we say, a little mundane, maybe even boring, right? So I'm going to do a little bit of a rant, uh, and I'm going to give you the history of this rant. I'm going to give you the reason for it, all right? So I think uh, that because of YouTube, dare I say it, Automakers have now started to build, these are very specific cars, right? Sports cars that are no longer fun to drive. Hmm. Because. Go on. Because what's happened is they've made them too much like race cars. They've made them too track focused. And I'll give you a couple examples of that, okay? And I'll give you, I'll tie it back into YouTube. So once upon a time, if you wanted a sports car, the manufacturers realized that you took all the best attributes of a race car, a track car, but you kind of detuned it, right? You made it less loud. You made it, you know, less harsh to drive, right? You made it more fun because most people didn't want the, uh, the, the, the kind of the, the hard edge that race cars have. 
but that has changed. Uh, and I'll give you two examples of actually three examples. The first one that, that, that really did change that probably as a brand was McLaren, right? So McLaren just basically took a, a, a race car and put it on the road. Uh, and to me, when you get into a McLaren, it just feels like um, like a racehorse, right? It's, it just wants to go, but it's nervous, it's twitchy, uh, and ultimately it's not a lot of fun to drive. Then the next manufacturer that took that model um, to heart was the was Ford with the GT right. The Ford mm-hmm. GT is uncomfortable. It's um, tight. Uh, there's no room in the, in, the, in the foot box. It's all the things that a race car would be right. All the compromises that you would do in a race car. Then recently I drove two cars that are as as ballsy race cars as you can get on the road. Uh, the Huracan uh, STO which is basically a Lamborghini's race car for the road. And that one is crazy because not only is it not fun, I think, to drive on the road, I only drove it on the track, but because it's so loud, it exceeds 130 decibels, it's actually illegal to drive it on many tracks. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> so that is so interesting. it's a race car for the road where it's legal to drive, but on the track it's actually illegal. Uh, and then probably the most interesting one, which was uh, the one that everybody loves. It's the uh, new Porsche uh, GT4 RS, right? Uh, Me and Tom, we were having a conversation about this, and what they did was they put the air intake literally like four inches behind your head. So when you're driving it, you hear like this incredibly loud, and when I say loud, I mean not like to 11, I know it's a cliche, but to like 20 uh, air intake. And if you love the sound of a Porsche, a Boxer, which I don't necessarily love. I think it's. I love the V8. I love like the Harley sound. I love that kind of heartbeat sound. The Porsche just sounds amazing. Well, you love it, right? It's the word you're looking for. Yeah. 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 No, I don't. I, no, it's like it's like it's like screaming. It's air intake, and you know the car is so track focused, right? All it's missing is a roll bar. Uh, you get it on the road, and it just beats you up, right? It's loud. It's uncompromising. Uh, and I think the reason that the, that the manufacturers have gone down this route is because YouTubers found out that the cars that are the most popular on their channels are the craziest cars, right? So. 10 years ago when we first, or 12 years ago when we first started doing YouTube, people like Street Speed and Shmi and who else does this, uh, Vehicle Virgins, started profiling all these crazy, either um, from the factory, but mainly built up uh, hyper and um, supercars, right? And they would put these crazy exhausts. And I think the manufacturers started watching those videos and noticed just how popular they were. And then they started building those cars for people to actually buy. And when you get behind the wheel of one of those, you kind of realize the difference between a movie car, which is cool and fun when you're watching it as a video, and a real car, which when you translate that to actually having to drive it on a daily basis is absolutely no fun to drive. So I, I believe it or not, for once, I, I agree with you like 85% of the way. Wow, on a podcast. Um, I, I think that's part of the issue is the performance envelope has gotten so high that to enjoy these cars, you have to be on a track or in a mm-hmm. closed environment where you can push them. Because to have fun in a GT RS, GT4 RS, or GT3, or you know any of the GT Porsches, you really nowadays have to be going so fast to really feel the dynamics of the car come to life. Um, and even like standard cars, like the Civic Si, right? This would run circles around an old CRX Si, but a CRX Si is gonna be a lot more fun in the city and every day, just because you're, you're screeching those 115 profile tires at like, you know, <laughs> 30 miles an hour. Um, I do, however, I do enjoy having these halo cars. I think it is cool because um, what what is smart and what these manufacturers know is that you get the GT4 RS to hang on your wall. That's the car you hang on your wall. But then you one you really buy is a standard Cayman or a Cayman S or a GT4, one that you can enjoy on the road. So I'm glad that they exist. I think it's cool that you have the track option, but let's be honest, nobody's bought it. And I don't think it's a recent thing. Like if you look at RS cars from the previous- Like you're, like you're saying like the Lamborghini Guntash, which is also miserable to drive, would have been the same- Yeah, but that was miserable on the track and miserable on the road. That was just miserable <laughs> just all the time. Really cool, it, it just looked just, really yeah, cool. Jay's right. Miserable. Um, so yeah. That's what you're saying. It was still miserable. It just, it just that one was, didn't, was any good on the track. I think Jay Leno drove it daily for years. Did he? Around L- wow. Yeah, around LA. Like, that was like, wow. he drove it from did he, to Did work. he ever have to back it up? <laughs> yeah, he probably had someone do it for him, maybe. Um, but, um, no, that's a bad example, because that was just a, that was a that's design like a, study I, I, more I, than that. That's a, an outlier. In my opinion, yeah. All right. But all of these, like, any anytime you see the word lightweight next to a car, or RS, 
or um, competition. These are the stripped down track versions. So I, I really do appreciate that. It you exists. know what a good analogy might be? Uh, like the CUDA. Not the, not, actually, not the CUDA, the. Um, uh, well, like the Yanko um, mm. or, or from the 60s. No, the Shelbys. Those might be good. Like, like the Shelbys, right? The Shelby Cobras would be a good. Example I don't know that, what they right? were like if, on the road. If, if you've ever been in a Shelby Cobra, right, you will, you will burn the skin off your feet because of those side pipes. Exactly. Oh. Or just getting out, you'll burn the back <laughs> yes. of your yes, legs. Yes, that is a good example. Right? Yeah. Dodge Viper 2, you know the original. I mean? It looks cool, but it, if, you, two. if yep. you ever had to live with one of them, you'd want to take you know a gun to your head because they're just so uncompromising <laughs> Yeah, in what they what they represent, but you know those were always kind of outliers, right? They were they weren't well, like Porsche. A, Porsche a GT4 RS is going to be an outlier. That's going to be a hundred thousand dollar markup but, just but for the, the old Porsches, right? The old RSs. This isn't the first RS. They, they were actually drivable on the road. These cars, to me, are just so track focused. And you're right, they are really good track cars. But I think maybe Porsche realizes that because of the world we're living in today. Nobody's ever going to drive it on the road. In fact, nobody's ever going to drive this thing, right? Because it's so valuable. If you get an allocation for it, you'll buy it, you'll put it into your garage. And I, 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 Tommy, we have some friends with four GTs, and as I'm, I'm mm -hmm. aware, they don't drive them. They take them out like once a year, and and you know they they say because if you put miles on a four GT, right, it lowers the value. I think it's because they're just no fun to drive on the road. Or I'm, both. Or both. Yeah. Um, it's a little different though, Dad, because I think back in the day, uh, there were really stripped down track going versions that people didn't like to drive every day. But they were done for race homologations. Um, because that was a big deal, be it rally, be it for touring car, right? You, you did have these really, really, really hardcore, crazy um, low volume vehicles. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure that has changed that much, but I do really think what has changed is due to the, the increase in suspension design and the width of tires and the compound of tires and the, the switch to bigger brakes is that to enjoy some of these sports cars, even like a standard Cayman, right, on a back road, you're going to have to be really pushing the bounds of going to jail in some cases on the speed. Whereas in my classic Mini, I can have a ton of fun at 39 okay, miles yeah, an hour. I, I completely agree with that argument, but I'm, I'm actually making a, a little bit different argument. You want more boring. Cars. No, you want the. No. I'm, I'm saying, Tom, <laughs> I'm saying you get into a Huracan STO or a GT4 uh, RS and you go drive at legal speeds in the canyon, you're going to be miserable in that thing. Well, or, sure. or a 4G. Not because it's you're not pushing it, just because it's so freaking hard edged that it's just no fun to drive, right? It, there's, right? there's no comfort in the thing. Yeah, but if you it's, can afford I mean, it. I mean, to be a race car driver, right, it's a hard job, right? You've got this engine screaming, you're concentrating. This is not something that, that most guys are doing because it's, it's, you know, a Sunday afternoon drive in the mountains. I mean, these guys are working hard, and these cars make you work hard even when you don't want to work hard because they're just so hard-edged. Uh, yeah, but that's the point. They're track cars. They're, they're, they're track cars. Every no, R is... Why, I, why, I don't want that. Why well, then would don't I buy it. That? Then buy a normal Cayman. There but you why, go. There's a solution. Problem I'm, solved. I'm saying why, why are manufacturers now building race cars for the road? Well, it's it not just... No, it it's not no, it makes no sense. Not, not, no. not sports cars, race cars for the road. But that's not a new thing, that Track day cars have been around for a long time. No, no, not... that, that, no, 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 no. I think, I don't want to get too argumentative, but look, the cool thing about Porsche, right, any, any Porsche, Cayman, is you can take it on the track and run it all day long, and it won't, you know, you could, you, could, you could take that 911, right, and hit red line after red line after red line, and then drive it home, and it'll work in both of those worlds. You'll be very comfortable as a daily driver in a 911, and you'll be very happy with it on the track. You're so, making some dangerous assumptions, though, that that's always been every Porsche, because it just has I, not I'm been. I'm saying the 911. I just said right. No. You can take the 911, and you can daily it. Or, but not every 911. Or you can you, you, you can take it to the track on the sure. weekend, right? And, you, and, you, and you're going to have a, a car that will perform exceptionally well. So there's a spectrum there, right? Where the road is one and the track is ten, and that car falls somewhere in between. Yeah. But now these new cars are always at ten. They're there's not no, always no, at ten. Yeah, well, I, if it's a track car, it's going to be at ten. Here's the thing, and, and this I just listened to a really smart Porsche expert talk about okay. this. Yeah. If it had the word RS behind it, it was always miserable on the road. 
always. This is not just a 2022 thing. Um, uh, the older 911 GT3 RS is miserable on the road. But that's a great thing, right? The RS is a car for someone that has a lot of money that wants to be the fastest on the track. That's someone that wants the ultimate expression of that car on the track. It's not a daily driver. Porsche has never marketed it as a daily driver. They've so, never so, said... So why not just throw a roll bar? Roll because it's, it. it's cool having it. <laughs> but that's... Hold up. Some of the old factory Porsches, and maybe even today, I don't know, had roll bars in them. Just throw a roll cage well, in that, it. That's take, great. Take out all the sound deadening. Get rid of all the because. The, that's what they did oh, on, hold, the RS, on the RS on the GT4. No, no, RS. I've been in the RS. It still has you know a radio and an air conditioner, right? Why do you have all that stuff if it's a pure race car? Just get rid of it. Great. I, I, you know why? Because they would never sell it. Exactly, because you need to keep it road legal to make mm -hmm. it appeal. No, an air conditioner doesn't make it unroad legal. It just it just wait. Yeah. No, but I'm saying the road legal thing is cool. People like the idea that they can road legal. Their, it, it, technically, the, the fastest version of the car is road legal. But it's never been marketed. I mean, Porsche has done models without radios. You, you, Porsche has done models without air conditioning. Yes, yes. You can get you can get a lightweight version of a 911 right now where you get like uh, you get less. Uh, it's it's actually the fastest 911 you can buy. Right. You pay ten thousand dollars and you lose the rear seats. You get uh, a carbon fiber roof. Uh, and I think you lose 80 pounds. Sure. Okay. But I'm saying if you're going to build a track car, then build a track car. Don't put a radio in it. Don't put an air conditioner sure. in it. Sure. Don't put like all the, because uh, uh, the, the, GT, the GT4 RS, as well as the Huracan STO, right, they still have all the creature comforts that you would expect in a road going car. So you're saying they're too soft. You want them to be even I'm more I'm just saying, firm. no, I'm saying if you're going to build a race car, for the road, just make it a race car. Just go all the way. Yeah, well, yeah, just go all it. the way. And the reason they don't do that is because nobody would buy it. So what they're selling is a car that ostensibly people think, this is the hardest edged Porsche I can buy for the track, but yet it's got all the creature comforts that I can drive it on the road. And what I'm saying is you can't. Sure. Don't pretend you can't. You will not be happy in that car on the road. Yeah, but I think people won't maybe, care. Maybe you will be happy driving it once a month to Cars and Coffee. I mean, you'll, I, you'll be able to live with that. I hate to say that. Uh, if you look at the if you look at the allocation cost that it costs to get an allocation right. on a GT3, people are disagreeing with the sentiment by a big margin. I mean, a GT3 allocation now is fifty grand for a 911. GT4 is probably going to be fifty thousand if you want an allocation. You see, we just I just got a spy photo right of yeah. the GT3 RS. Yeah. Did you see the wing on that thing? Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. It's huge. But people buy these cars because kind of like you know with the four GTs, they buy them. They know exactly what it is they're getting. Yeah. They're not planning to keep them forever. They know they're going to go up actually, in value. Actually, Jay, I don't think so. I think a lot of people don't know what they're getting. I think a lot of people are buying the thing because it's unobtainium. And they're, that's the other problem, right? Today, a well, lot of yes, people are, are buying these cars because they don't want to drive them. All they want to do is it's an investment as a commodity, right? right they're exactly. No, they're just buying them because they know that they'll appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. That, that was my point. They know that they're, what they're buying is a solid investment because there is a solid history with these cars. Right. With Porsches, with Ferraris, yes. you name it, with these special edition like track cars. Balls for the, to road. the wall. Right, exactly. Yeah. They know that this is going to increase in value actually very quickly. And that is a depressing thought that people are yes. just buying them to park it. But that's just kind of the but reality. That's what I said. The friends I know who have the GT, Ford GT, once a year. And, and, that was, year. and, and Ford was trying to prevent that very thing from happening yeah. when. The GT, this, this generation GT was launching. Remember, there was that whole application process. You had to say, so they were trying or, to keep people from flipping, from flipping them, right? Right. It was not just that, but they also wanted to have people to actually drive them, to take them to cars and coffee events on a regular basis. But they're not doing that. I just don't want you to, because because what it can come. I understand your point now, and I appreciate your point. But what I don't want the comments to all be is, Roman is complaining that the track car is bad when it's not on the track. I, I'm saying I'm, <laughs> because that's kind of what you're saying. The track car is it, the GT4S is ostensibly, to your point, it's built to be a Nuremberg green killer, right? And it's built to be the ultimate purest um, nine or uh, Cayman GT4. Um, and, and yes, it's going to be bad on the road because at some point, like the 911 has that really big bandwidth, right? But there are certainly cars more comfortable on the road and there are certainly yeah, cars I mean, better on the track. I mean, I could see Porsche saying, you know, we build a regular Cayman. Which they do. Right. So this is this is the hardest edged, most track focused. But there has been, I think, this recent and I think it's been draw, it's been pushed out there by YouTube to make things very extreme. 
where uh, it gets to the point that they're almost... I think... I, then I shouldn't say undrivable, but they're just no fun to drive. So can I give you a better example? Yeah. You are saying exactly things I agree with, but you chose the perfectly wrong car to make the okay, point with. Right. A better example to that is the BMW M3 and M5, the yep. standard M3 and M5, because those have always been very, very, very drivable daily cars that are screamers in, under the hood. Um, and if you look at like uh, the progression of the M3 and the M5, right? Absolutely. Um, throughout the years, they've always been very comfortable, but this latest generation of especially M3, even the standard one, is so harsh, so firm, so buttoned down that it's very difficult to daily drive. And you're, you're not even talking about the competition. Oh, competition is like off the scales. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's like when, yeah, approaching I'm saying, I'm, RS so, so thank you. I'm just saying there's this now this trend to build these extremely track-focused cars. Yep. And I don't understand it because I think I think it's cool. It's, it makes great advertorial and advertising copy. It makes for great YouTube videos. But what's keeping that market afloat, I think, is the value that the cars are attaining and not the fact that they're actually great yeah. cars. Because I'm sorry, but a race car for the road is a pretty bad car. Well, let's be honest. And right? with, a, with a bad driver, it's a very dangerous situation. There's one, there's one really good example of a car that competed against another car, which was the go-to old guy car, and then died off. What's that? Wait, let's see if you can figure it out. Corvette? So the Corvette is the car that is still sticking around. That's the car that was actually pretty comfortable on the road, that was actually very drivable, that old guys like. But what was the Corvette's competition that's no longer around? Yeah, I'm stumped, dude. Mm -hmm. uh -oh. I was just talking to someone about How this. How old? Manual only, discontinued a few years the ago. The Viper. The Viper. You're talking about the Viper. The Viper. Uh, Tommy, so I, the I, Viper I, was too much of a compromise could, for could, the... I know you want to tell your story, but I just want to say this really quick. It was too much of a compromise for the consumer base. It was manual transmission only. You'd burn your leg getting in and out of it. It was dangerous. It <laughs> uh, didn't have traction control for years and years and years. It was just too stripped down and hardcore. Can, can I just make this argument then? What? The Viper. And I've driven both of them, right? Mm -hmm. On the track and on the road. The Viper, when you compare it to like the Huracan STO, yep. would be like comparing the Huracan STO to an old fashioned Coupe de Ville. Sure. That, that's right. how much right. sharper and how much more race folk. I mean, these are truly race cars, like in terms of their noise, in terms of their shifting, mm -hmm. right? in terms of their suspension compliance, right? You yeah. take those things on anything but a, a glass smooth track and you're going to feel every pregnant ant you run over. Right. And it's not going to be pleasant. But here's the thing. With the Huracan, with the Cayman, there are other options, right? If you don't want to feel every pregnant ant, just get the standard Huracan. If but, you don't want your leg getting burned in a Viper, there was no, like, so, Viper luxury. You'd always get your so, leg so burned. So let me finish. And I think Jay brought up a really good point. I'm saying, I'm saying that these cars would be marketplace duds if it wasn't for the fact that we're living in this really weird time now where people are buying them not because they're good cars for what they are but because they're very collectible and people you know want to collect them and because they appreciate them so few people have actually driven these cars right this is right. the problem very few people drive these cars it's like yeah. there's a handful of automotive journalists who have driven them and very few people who even know how how to properly right. drive and then these there's cars. a handful of like youtubers who are never going to be like like hey i bought yeah. <laughs> i bought the gt4 rs and you know what <laughs> my girlfriend and my mom hate this thing right they're, and then they crashed it or something. Yeah, they're yeah. never they're never going to say that, right? They're going to be like, "This is the best car ever," uh, uh, and and all this hype is 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 I think not doing the car the service that it deserves. I look on the track. There is nothing better than a GT4 RS or uh, a Huracan STO or you know pick the race car. But on the road, they're just. They're just no fun. And, and I think that was my only point, that manufacturers have now decided that, that people want race cars for the road. Although, let's be honest, Ed, this has been going on since the beginning of the car. You know, if you look at, like, what the cars that, that were hyped up in the 1980s, the supercars, if you look okay. back at them, they were just garbage. Everybody, oh, my God, you got to go drive a, a Kuntash. Yeah, or, or Ferrari 308 is just a phenomenal thing, right? And it, it, looking well, back at it, we're like, yeah, they were right, brilliant right, things to right, look right, at. Right, one more point. Well, well, Interior is well, made of cardboard, literally. <laughs> yeah, one more literally. point to Jay's point, and then we're going to have to get back to our fuel efficiency. Yeah, cars, exactly. What, we, what, we've what really gone off, off the track. One more point. <laughs> the, the reason you can also do these cars today is because of all the technical nannies that allow you to actually drive these cars on the road. Because back in the day, you know, if you took a race car and put it on the road, 
you know, be it a NASCAR or a European performance car, unless you knew what you were doing, chances are the very first tree would be well, the very last tree you'd Well, pass. that was, a, people don't realize this, even like the Shelby Mustangs, the original ones, right? Well, you don't they have to they go, were dangerous. You don't have to go that far back to find a car like that. The Porsche Carrera GT. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. That, Paul Walker. Yeah. yeah. Right? And that that guy driving it did know what he was doing, by the way, apparently, and he still ended up in a bad situation. Um, so you don't have to go that far back. But, it, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting But point. the technology has allowed now these cars that, that, that are very powerful. Um, Absolutely. Very hardcore to actually, you know, stay on the road. <laughs> Sure. All right. Well, let's keep going. Okay. Let's so go, let's go back to our, our consumer. Right. Back to <laughs> the original bit. Now, this next one, very similar to the Miata, but if you get a few extra dollars, the BMW Z4. No. Now, no. Sorry. Yeah. This is the S Drive 30. Well, okay. Uh, make your. Let, let's hear your uh, reasoning there. You know, it's one of these things. BMW. When this, when this car came out, I was at the Paris Motor Show, I believe that's what it was when it debuted, and I was asking them, why did you do this? Their previous Z4 didn't sell, and they're like, listen, BMWs and Roadsters, they just, they, we always have to have a Roadster, and there's still people out there who love BMW Roadsters. Yes, so, um, first of all, huge fan of the Z3, love the early Z4s. I don't like the new Z4. So, uh, Sofian wants one of these, actually, speaking of Red Line reviews, he, he wants a Z4. Um, and I just, we had one at the office, it was like 70 Gs, it had the, the little force. The German one. Supra? <laughs> yeah, but it's just not a, well, it's just, I know, don't think it's a very good we'll looking car. We'll get to that eventually. The Japanese <laughs> in, in Supra? The, in this generation of Z4, I'm just not sure it's that attractive. I didn't think it drove particularly well, and I just thought it was a lot of money for what you get. But what's the fuel economy? What's the combined? See, that's what I wanted to get at. You were getting 20 in the city, 40 in the highway, and a combined 29. So you say 40 on the highway? Exactly. Is that four, a four? No, 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 no. But for the S Drive 30. Sure, I, the little one. The, the yeah, the less powerful one. So you're still hitting that 40 miles per gallon on the highway. I was. Yeah, that's very that's impressive. That's not. You know, that's not terrible, but um, again, it, it, it's the same problems as the Miata. It's a two-seater. It's just not a very... But you fit in this one. Driver. I do. This one is actually pretty but Roman comfy. fits in it. Yeah, it's yeah, pretty comfy. So, okay, and, but then, and actually, I would say the Supra, uh, you know, is also, going back to our previous conversation, a little hard-edged for a lot of people. And I think the sales numbers... Yeah. The only car that's not as hard-edged that's like, you know, an affordable modern-day sports car would be like the 86, right? That that yeah, one is right. more traditional. Or the Miata. Miata's pretty soft, yeah, more, too. Yeah, Miata's yeah, are pretty yeah, soft. Yeah. But here's the issue with your manufacturer. So say you build a car for the 99% of ways that 99% of people are going to make it. Like, like the Z has always, for a lot of cases, been like that, right? It's pretty cushy. Then you get all the automotive journalists saying, oh, it's not very firm and it rolls around in the corners. And so, so you, it's just no winning, right? They either build the car for the 99% of people um, and oh, it is comfortable, like but then the, the, then the 99% of people don't want to buy it because all the auto journalists said, oh, but it's too soft and rolls in the corners. I, I, look, I was ready to buy a Z. We've owned, I've owned three of them. Your, de- your grandpa's owned some. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's, it, they hit the compromise just right. And then I sat and I didn't fit. Yeah, that's a bummer. Yeah. yeah. Same thing with the Supra. I don't fit. I I mean, but you fit in this? I do fit in this. That's I just think it's such an outlier. This is like a, you know, a, a fourth car. At best. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah. this next one. Okay. Yeah, that's a great car ruined by the infotainment system. So Jay just put up the picture of the new Mark 8 Golf GTI. Exactly. Um, the e eight four-cylinder is a lot of fun to drive. The chassis dynamics are fantastic. I think the front end is a little droopy. Um, the interior quality is great. Uh, it's a pretty good value, but that infotainment system, I mean, it got to the point where when I was driving the Golf Far Loner we had, I we got so frustrated with it, I, it was stuck on some AM talk show from the 1970s. Mm-hmm. It played for four days straight. So for all of you non, <laughs> non-North Americans, let me explain something here. Uh, this is a great choice, uh, and you may be wondering, I can, I can hear people screaming at their iPod or wherever they're listening, or their iPhone. The or Golf GTI, we should say. I don't even know if I said that word. Right. I'm just saying, I can, I can hear a lot of people screaming, why would you not pick the diesel version of this? Why wouldn't you pick the diesel version of it? Because this? it's been dead in the U.S. for seven exactly. years. Yeah, we yeah. only get two, two versions of the Golf now. That's the GTI and the Golf R. Everything else in Europe, you get you know much smaller powertrains. You get diesel versions of it around the world. We get the GTI and we get the Golf R. Those well, are our only choices. Or if you want to go fuel efficient, then you got to go ID4. We so don't even get the ID3. I didn't want to be too – I shouldn't be too harsh on the infotainment. You can figure it out. 
but the oh, haptic it's, it's, controls, the lack of the volume knob. Yeah, it's not good. It's just not good. No. Yeah. You know, in Europe, actually, this is a fun thing, too. Um, if you look back at the generations of Golf, not only did they have a GTI, you know, but they had a GTD, which was That's a right. diesel version of the GTI. Exactly. And they also have a GTE, which is a plug-in hybrid sporty model. All right, before, before you get to the next one, Jay, can I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, how about your brand new personal car? Would that fit in this category? And tell them what it is and tell them the fuel economy. Yeah, I bought a brand new Subaru Crosstrek Sport. And yes, Roman, it does have the uh, <clears throat> dreaded CVT. But let me look up the exact fuel economy numbers. But I bet you the fuel economy is pretty Yeah, actually pretty it phenomenal. is. Exactly. Because you've got the smaller engine, right? You don't. No, have... no, 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 no. I got the bigger engine. Oh, you got the bigger engine. Which is the 2.5. Oh. But, 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 this was very interesting is that the the 2.5 engine and the 2.0, the standard engine, get roughly the same fuel economy. So I know, isn't it getting, weird? I yeah. know. And, and, you're and getting, one, one makes more horsepower. Oh, one, the 2.5. Yeah, yours makes more horsepower. By like, wait, I think it's rated at 182 horsepower. Well, the um, issue is, is that you have to rev out the little four-cylinder, the smaller one, so much in order to maintain yeah. the same speed as the bigger engine. And this is, this is something we figured out when we had our uh, Challenger Hellcat. Uh, <laughs> Right, so uh, sometimes the smaller engine doesn't mean it's more fuel efficient. So the crazy thing about the Challenger engine, of course, it put out 707 horsepower, mm -hmm. uh, and if you drove it uh, around town, you'd be in the low 20, the low man, no, no be like 17. On the highway, it would do 20. No, on the highway, it would do 30. But well, around, let's not get too optimistic. Around town, it would do like 17. I'm not sure I've ever seen 30 in you that You would do car. 30. If you, were, if you were cranking along, that that Hellcat power plant was like 1,500 RPM at 65 <laughs> miles an hour, you would get 30. You would just... I think we averaged like 23 on our trip to California. I think we did like 27. Uh, well, I don't think it was that good. I think we did one fuel economy stop, and we did 27. But around town, it was pretty, yeah. pretty terrifying. But... You know, big engine, uh, car that, you know, just kind of moseys on down the road as long as you're not putting your foot into it, spinning up the supercharger. It actually wasn't horrible, uh, and it may be something uh, that you might want to keep in mind. So Sometimes smaller engines don't mean better fuel economy. Yeah, but that's a little bit of a, I mean... That's, that's was, extreme. It's yeah, an Yeah, that's extreme, and, and, and it's not always true, because then with the big engine, of course, you're buying a Hellcat not for fuel economy because you want to hear it. So it was very... It was sort of efficient on the highway, but it was not very good in the did, did city. Do we, we get the numbers on this? Yeah, so the Golf GTI 2022 four-cylinder manual transmission turbo, 28 combined, 24 city, 34 highway, and 370 miles of total range. That's going to cost you $2,300 in gasoline every year. Yeah, not bad. Good, good little car. Fantastic uh, powertrain, fantastic uh, road dynamics. I would get the GTI over the Golf R. I actually think the GTI is like 85% of a Golf R, um, except, of course, minus all-wheel drive. But I just don't like that infotainment system very much. Yeah, I'm with you. All well, right, it's also a good family car. Bear also a good family car, yeah. yeah well, any, look, any, like any, the SI, it can any, do what you need it to do. Any hatchback, right? Yeah. Any hatchback is going to always have... Those hatchbacks have this amazing ability. Like you go to Ikea and you buy some crazy you know, piece of furniture and you look at the box it comes in and you're like, this is never going to fit. And then you get it to your let's say GTI and you open up the back and somehow mysteriously when you put the seats down and move the passenger seat forward it all works I don't know how that happens but it works exactly okay, okay. next up the BMW 330i xDrive now official numbers 19 city 44 highway and combined 29 what do you think, Tommy? Are you enjoying yeah, the X-Drive? It's good. They also do a plug-in hybrid version, but I would probably stick with the standard 2-liter. Uh, I think that this is a fantastic generation of 3-series. It still has the normal size grills on the front of it. In case for now. Notice. For now. For now. I do like the new 3-series quite a lot, actually. Um, I mean, it's kind of got its thunder stolen by the Model 3, which is going to be a lot more efficient. But um, if you do want a fantastic driving uh, generation of 3 Series, these new G-bodies are really good. Or get the i4, right? If yeah. You, if you want to go, because it's basically a, a 3 Series that's all electric. So there's a new i4. Yep. There's the M40 and the M50, right? So there's the two-wheel drive and the all-wheel drive. Uh, and we just compared it. We did a video uh, and drag race it against a Tesla Model 3 performance. So head over to uh, alltfl.com if you want to see that video where it's still up there. Cool. All right. Should we keep going? Jay, yep. What's more? next? Next up, 
the Acura ILX. Now, bear in mind, everybody, this is being discontinued. 2022 is the final model year. What is replacing it, Tommy? The Integra. That's right. But for right now, you can still get it. Eight, they're still available. 18 in the city, 42 in the highway, and a combined 28 miles per gallon. Pretty and good. because it's being phased out, you probably get a decent deal on it right now. So 42 uh, miles per gallon. Uh, well, I would, I would if you can find brother, one. <laughs> if you can find one. Uh, look, uh, yeah, um, I think the, the, the auto buying paradigm has completely changed. You, we are way past, like, I'm going to drive by my local Honda dealer, see if they have one. So, yes, you probably can get one, but you're going to have to go to, like, Auto Trader and do some digging and be prepared to, like, fly somewhere and drive it home, which is fine, which is great. I love doing that. There's nothing more fun than I flying. I did that when I bought my Crosstrek. Yeah. yeah, And, you, it, well, and that was okay. Ohio, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's fun. Was it fun tri cross-country tripping? It? Except driving through one specific state that I won't mention. But um, other than that, it was a great, yeah, it was nothing like a little mini cross-country road trip. And I got to check out my new car at the same time. Did you drive by way of Alaska? <laughs> No, I did not drive by way of Alaska. So, so let me guess. So, Illinois, Iowa, Nebraska are some of the states you would have passed through. Is one of those three the one you don't want to mention? Indiana, of course, is another Correct. one. Correct. Okay. All right. One, one of, of those. those. It, it's there. I just don't want to uh, okay. uh, offend any uh, of our viewers here. All right. What's next? Next up is the Audi A4. Seriously, this one is pretty good. I was surprised. What's the, what's the fuel economy? We are for the Premium Plus. 18 in the city, and again, 40 on the highway. You, you seem to have Are a pension. Are you sure it's 40? That's Dude, these numbers seem a little much. You have a pension for sedans. 18 in the well, city? Well, the reason why I went with sedans is, again, these are cars that people can do multiple things with. Are you they're looking not, at 2022? Yes. Okay. These are cars that are not, again, they're not crossovers. They're fun to drive, and they're also good family cars. All right. Well, let's 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 pick some crossovers because I think that's where the where a lot of the excitement is right now. So hold up on your list. I'm going to give you a couple of crossovers that I would consider, and I, okay. think, I think are fuel efficient crossovers. I, I think are relatively uh, fuel efficient, and I think are also fun to drive. Now, I, I would love to mention um, some of the Subaru crossovers, uh, but Subaru doesn't loan, loan us cars. So even though there is a new Forester. Uh, there's a new Outback or refreshed Outback. We have yet to drive them. We did try to make up with Subaru, try to bury the hatchet, but they so decided. So what are, what, are what are some of your favorite crossovers? Uh, so do we want to go, how, how do you want to do this? Well, this? I'm just going to point out some couple. So I, the RAV4 Prime is a ton of fun. It's the plug-in hybrid Toyota RAV4 to go like 40-something miles on a single charge. I'm thinking much better. Than, I'm thinking much more fun than that. Well, but it has to be efficient, and the RAV4 Prime is right, I'll give efficient. You one. Okay. Uh, the new Bronco with the small engine. Not that efficient. You think it's bad? Yeah, it's not great. No. Especially the now that we're... 2.3? Yeah. With yeah, the it's not horrible, but it's not it's no. nothing I would shake a stick at. No, I mean, I think we got to... We got to oh. give folks consumer advice for some very. Uh, that's that's okay. It's just Jay's camera has died. So if you miss if you miss Jay, <laughs> sorry about that. Everyone, right. I'm still here. He's so, still here. Some efficient examples, um, yeah. like hybridized. I think um, in terms of fun to drive, the Rav4 Prime is awesome. If you look at electric Model Y, it's a absolute blast to cruise. Tucson Hybrid. Tucson Hybrid is not a whole lot of fun though. I like it. I like the style. I like the style. I think it, it looks good. I, I just it, drove the... It's a good-looking car. I just drove the sister car to that, the Sportage Hybrid. Yeah, the Kia. And oh, That's a plug-in hybrid, isn't it? No, they have two. I didn't yeah. drive the plug-in. It's yeah. just a standard one. They have this weird thing where they have a turbo hybrid with the automatic. Yeah. It felt pretty slow. Really? I was actually right, really right, surprised. All right, let me, let me... Okay, if you don't like the Bronco, how about the Bronco Sport? Yeah, that's... That's a good good choice. Yeah, yeah I really I, like the Bronco I, I Sport. I think that's a that's a fuel efficient car uh, that is fun to drive. It's off road worthy. It makes a statement. You know what I mean? It, 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 it's it's not just another box on wheels. Um, you know, it's it's a good looking, capably off road, bad weather car. I'd say the Kona EV, the, the fully electric Kona. Okay. A lot of fun to drive. A lot of torque steer, but it, it's a good car and it's really pretty fast over 200 miles of range. All right, let me, let me throw some. Two others out there. See what you think. Yep. All right. The two Jeep 4xe's, the Wrangler 4xe and the Grand Cherokee 4xe. Now, these are plug-in hybrids. Both yes. of them get about 20 miles on pure electric. Yep. Uh, and they are qualify for the 7,500 federal tax uh -huh. credit. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think they're, you know, very fuel efficient and fun to drive and express personality. 
Yeah, I think they're good. I um, I, they do have a lot going on in terms of combining. So you're, are you worried about reliability? Is a little bit. I mean, it's definitely a concern of mine in the long run. Okay. Uh, I do like the. I mean, the issues with like the four by E's, the Wrangler is. I think you get better fuel economy if you get a standard two liter when that battery dies because you're lugging around that big heavy battery. Um, but I do like the all electric range on the four by E. That's a nice feature. All right. How about another one? We're, I'm just going to toss out cars. You guys decide. Okay. It. Okay. Mercedes Benz. Can you guess? What? GLB. Yeah, not super efficient for what it is. Kind it's of a, a box. It's a three-row small crossover. If you want a three-row crossover, yeah. it's got a, the only downside of that car is it's got a dual clutch, which I'm not in love with. But it's going to be one of the most fuel-efficient three-row cars you can buy. And actually, I drove one not too long ago. Yeah? Yeah. And it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I was, I was really surprised. I, I was just, not expecting that. I wasn't too impressed with the fuel economy we were getting. Um, I would... Actually, if you want a luxury uh, SUV with, with uh, hybrid capability, I would definitely take a look at the X5 plug-in hybrid. The new mm -hmm. one's got a lot of electric range for what it is, and it now has the six-cylinder engine. So the old plug-in hybrid X5 had the four, the new one has the six, and it's really good. The All 45E, right. correct. All right. I'm going to throw another one. Okay, you ready? All right. I'm just, I'm on a roll now. Go. All right. Uh, Chevy. No. Tahoe mm. with the Z, Z71 with the straight six. Diesel. Oh. Okay. They just put that into it. You in the Z71 it. too? Yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a really that's good okay. one. That's okay, yeah. That's... I, I said no right away because I couldn't think of a Chevy SUV that gets good fuel economy. No, that's a good... That's a pretty good... It's a great diesel engine. Yeah, it's... Nice and torquey. Well, diesel's it's expensive smooth. now, unfortunately. That's yes. a downside. But, yeah. it, but, it, but for a big, you know, real three-row, right, where yeah. you can actually haul, all right? Diesel's very expensive. How about, how about, here's another one. Okay. Right. Here's another one that you should consider. Toyota. Yep. Sienna Hybrid. Well, yes, yeah, fantastic. It's just a, not a huge amount of fun, but it's a great car. Fuel efficient. Very fuel efficient. Yeah, it's a great one. Mm. So I, I will now throw out a couple because I think we're okay. going off the deep end here a little bit. All with right, the go Sienna. for it. All right. I think we need to talk about some fun cars that are not brand new and expensive. Cars in the used market, which are are fun to drive and can also be okay. Yeah, let's go for it. All right, so yeah. I would pitch to you the first generation Honda Insight. Ours, oh. ours oh was ouch. No, hold up. Oh, our, our battery was cost more to replace than the value of the car. It was only like fifteen hundred bucks to replace the battery, and the, and the car was Still, worth like fifteen hundred bucks because we bought a bad one. Now the first gen Honda Insight manual mm -hmm. transmission. Now, for That's all true. of you who can't picture this, right? It looks a little bit like a cockroach. Let's be honest. Well, it's, it looks, it's, yeah. it's got these it's a door stop. It's got these skirted, you know, rear wheels. That car was kind some of, of the most space age technology that Honda's ever done. Though it was fully aluminum, <laughs> built in the same plant as the S two thousand. Can I finish? It's got a manual transmission. And ours was totally clapped out. It was completely Look, I, at the end of its life. I completely agree with you, Tommy. And it got, what kind of fuel economy do you think Incredible. I completely agree with 60 you. 60 MPG. Except ours smelled like cat pee, and I could never get that out of my brain. So to me, that car will forever smell like cat piss, and so I can't, I can't get past <laughs> how bad ours was. Well, don't, don't buy one that smells like cat pee, but they're fantastic cars. A lot of fun. I just can't get past it, yeah. It was just horrible. Horrible, it, horrible, horrible. What? But you you have to I know, as a journalist I take the cat pee out of the I equation. Can't. I just can't. I just every time I think of that car, <laughs> you're that, traumatized by yeah, it. Yeah, that, that, that stench comes wafting into my nose. And that's all I could think of. <laughs> Three cylinder, by the way. Little interesting engine. It's got this clean burn mode too, which it goes. I was say if you're gonna do that, just get the first gen Prius. No, because the first gen Prius is very. It's a it, at least you can, it has rear seats. How about that? But it's very boring. But it has rear seats. Yeah, and also not nearly as fuel efficient. First gen Priuses do like 40, Insights do like 60. The problem with all those is they're all so clapped out. They all got driven. Yeah. Now, I of do miles. like the first gen Prius. I think it's a good option, uh, but you can't find them, like you said, they're right, clapped they're out. Clapped. But they are also pretty cool. All right, all right. How, how about, how about, how about a, a, a Mercedes Benz 124 or is it 123 diesel? Uh, yeah, they're not really that efficient. Mm -hmm. Mine was not very efficient. And they're smoky. Well, what people do with the old diesel Mercedes is they run them on SVO, straight veggie oil, yeah. which requires a little bit of a conversion because you have to put a tank heater in for when it's cold. And if you want the, if you want the if, wagon, they're expensive. Well, the biggest issue is if you really want to save money, you have to run it on straight veggie oil, in which case you can run it for practically free. But then you have to make your own veggie oil, and that is mm. one of the nastiest, dirtiest, smelliest, grossest processes of anything in the automotive yeah, world. Yeah, people think you just go to a restaurant and get the old fryer. Well, you do, but yeah. then you have to it's... filter it and filter it and filter it in your garage and drums, and it gets everywhere, and you have to do it through <laughs> jeans. And it's a, You're going to get oil it's stained It's horribly clothes and gross. Yeah. Really gross but stuff. But, Tommy, you mentioned a good point with the old Honda Insight. Yeah. 
Speaking of Hondas, hybrids, and manuals, there is another one. Yeah, the CRZ. There That's it is. A fun one. Yeah, the Honda CRZ. A little bit of an identity crisis in the CRZ. This was that two seater sports yeah, once car. Once again, no, yeah, no rear seat. You know, I got a rear seat in Europe, and for some unfathomable oh, really? reason, they pulled it out of the American. So if you get the American version, there are like these two indentations. Let's say do not sit. Yeah, where there should be a seat, but yeah. for some reason, they decided in America will make it less. Sellable. So other good options, Case is going to hate me for saying this, our videographer, but first-gen Volts are pretty cool. I really do like the first-gen Chevy Volt. Those were good. They were good. They were good. They were really good, yeah. I love the first-gen Volt. Actually, I love the second-gen Volt, too. Uh, yeah, second-gen wasn't as wacky, though. First-gen yeah. was first kind of are cooler. But yeah, I it was, agree. No, it was a really solid car. Really and solid it, car. Once again, yeah. no... Uh, Three passenger rear seat. I think that hurt it a lot. I it's would, a four seater. I would pitch you some interesting options. Yeah, the ELR. ELR, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is basically yeah, right. the Cadillac version of that. If you were really like on a budget, thousand dollars more. Those, are, you know, those for, for a long time were like twenty four thousand dollars. They were eighty five thousand new, exactly, and they They're dropped like to like like mid twenties for the longest time. I always wanted one. It was my kind of guilty pleasure in that red color, but yep. I, I have yet to see what they're recently doing. But they were, like I say, they were like $25,000. Uh, any of the diesel gig cars, by the way? The mid-2000s Volkswagens? They were, if they're fixed? Or, or even, kind of regardless. Okay. They are very, very fuel efficient and they have good power. So that, that includes Volkswagen, Audis, right? Well, I'm thinking primarily Porsche, like... They all have that 3-liter diesel. Golfs, um, the Alltrack Golfs, Jettas, the smaller ones are... Golf, Porsche, Cayenne Hybrid. It's a diesel. Golf, and it's a, Porsche, Cayenne. No, sorry. Porsche, Cayenne, hybrid diesel. Did they do a hybrid diesel? I think they did a hybrid uh, diesel. Was it diesel was hybrid or was it a... Was it the a gas one was hybrid. hybrid. Anyway, the, the I, Cayenne hybrid. I don't like that 3-liter diesel very much. Okay. Mm. Not really my thing. Um, I, I would be willing to put out a couple others. Yeah, what do you got? The Geo Metro. 90s Geo <laughs> Metro. You said it, everyone. You just said it. Three cylinders, based on the Suzuki Swift. Very reliable. I was just looking at the oh fuel economy ratings. Just get a, sam oh get a samurai or a tracker. No, at that they're point. not efficient. Geo Metros, if you get the, the fuel efficient one, which I think was the XFI, they'll do like 50 mpg. For real. Yeah, cool. And Other if, one. If the wind blows on it, it'll like tip, it'll just tip over. Yeah. yeah, but they're very cheap. And if you I think need, they weigh like 200 pounds. If you need a dirt cheap car to get you to work. <laughs> Who's gonna find a Geo Metro? God, they're gonna, around. They built uh, a ton of them. I haven't God. seen. I haven't seen a Geo Metro in years. Yeah, they're gone. I they, just they saw six of them away. at the junkyard. They yeah, yes, exactly. yeah. Aside from the junkyard, but that's where that I got the buy. idea. The Geo Metro. They're really good cars, actually. And you could buy six for like twenty bucks. Well, you see, the Geo Metro is one of these cars that's the butt of every joke, as we're proving. But for folks that have a small amount of money and need a good, solid, reliable car to get them to places, the Geo Metro, honestly, not a bad option. At that point, just buy yourself like a Chinese scooter. Available at your local junkyard. No, I'm serious. Like, I'm genuinely serious. There's a yeah. lot of people that just need a few seats. A scooter. They need a few seats, <laughs> and they need a family. They have a family they need to get to the places. The Geo Metro. Like, I'm, this is genuine consumer advice. I'm surprised you guys are giving me more crap about my Golf Porsche. <laughs> so I would definitely consider... <laughs> Definitely consider Geo Metro. Yeah. A lot of those cars from the 80s, actually, like the CRX HF, also oh, yeah. in the 50 MPG range, if you can find one. Those are really, really good cars. Um, the reason that these cars were so efficient is not because they used advanced technologies, but they were just so incredibly lightweight. So, like, there was my friend Steve had a Civic HF, right? Yeah, once again. There you go. Great option. The, the problem with that car was the way that they got to fuel efficiency in the 80s. But by stripping everything out of them. And by, by taking the horsepower out of yeah. them. Yeah. They were, they were anemic. Sure. Right. No fun. Just. But they're kind of fun now. Now that we're 40 years into it, I think they kind of have a charm to them, and there's a lot of fun. Surrounding right. How about them. if somebody wants a modern car that you know is gonna also protect their family with you know the latest or at least as close to it? Let's yeah. go back like you know not 30 years, but let's go back like 10 years. I would pitch to you yeah. um, the Rabbit Diesel from the. Mm. Now you've gone back 40 years. Early 1980s. <laughs> uh, no, no. I think a good one from the recent history is the Lexus CT200H. Yeah, that's a yeah, good one. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good a one. Little, yeah. little, little, little yeah. hatchback Actually, I wagon. They, I think they just discontinued in in Japan. Oh, did like, they? Like very, very recently. That is. I think it's, that is. It stuck around for a if, while. If I were to pick one car, I would recommend out of all these. You just nailed that one. A little boring to drive, though. But it's incredibly fuel efficient, and they're pretty unique, and they're pretty cool, and they're, you know, Toyotas underneath, uh, so they're going to run forever. Uh, and, you know, they're using Toyota Synergy Drive. It's a really good little car. I would also pitch to you the uh, BMW i3. 
used i3s are, uh, they're getting more expensive actually. They were like 15 and now they're like 25, but fantastically engineered how, cars. Uh, Volkswagen how, e-Golf. Yeah, how about any of those? Yeah, compliance cars. It's All of them are really mm -hmm. pretty good, um, especially if they're still in battery warranty. I wouldn't get an old Leaf because those had air-cooled batteries and they do fail, but i3s, uh, very few battery so failures. E-Golfs, very good. I would only get the ones with the range extender. The problem is with those compliance cars, now that we're into the more, let's say call it the electric car 2.0, right? Where once you get used to having an electric car that has over 200 miles of range, it's really hard because we've had the smart EV, we've had the spark EV. It's really hard to go to an electric car that has like officially 70 or 80 miles of range, but unofficially when it's cold, like 50. It's just, it's just not. It's just because you're spoiled is the word. No, it's not. For. No, it's just not usable. I thought it was easy. I mean, just for cruising around town, oh, it was miserable. 70 miles of range is all you need. Yeah. Uh, spark EV, lovely car. I truly loved it. I never once had range anxiety. It got I, me everywhere I, I, I think needed to go. For City car, you need at least 100 miles, like we've proven with mm -hmm. the Mini SE, at least 100, and ideally more than that. But yeah, so first generation uh, e-golfs had 80, useless. No. Second gen sec the second version had like 120, 25 if I remember right. So those are actually pretty usable. But once again, they're because everybody wants electric cars, they were like, uh, they for a long time you could buy them. They were like 35,000, but the dealers were discounting them, so you can get them for like 25. Now they're still 25 or more. I think e-golfs are great. I think Spark EVs are great. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Fiat 500Es are really, really fun. Ugh. Also really good cars. Um, not enough range. Well, that's your opinion. Yeah. Uh, how about how about like, not the Ionic 5, but how about like the Ionic? Yeah, good cars. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. Know? That's also awesome. very good. Yeah, lots of good used options. Um, the Focus EV? No. No? <laughs> didn't like that one very much, actually. One of the few uh, compliance cars that didn't think worked very well. Okay. Well, wasn't there a Fusion EV as well? No, that was a fusion energy, energy that's plug-in right. hybrid. Yeah, the, uh, the Max. That was another C Max. C Max Energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lots of, lots of lots of plug-in hybrids. Actually, the C Max Energy may not be a bad one. That's a hybrid, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm sure those things have you know not appreciated over the years. But they are very roomy, and you know that's the one. Like that's the one you 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 probably really want instead of the Metro because it's going to get better fuel economy than the Metro because it is a hybrid and it's probably kind of under the radar right now for most exactly. people. Exactly. The, the Metro. The uh, Geo Metro? The Geo Metro, yeah. No, I, then I'm talking about like if you have $3,000 to spend on a car, get a Geo Metro. Get a motorcycle. Yeah, but people have to, I'm serious, people I'm, have I'm, to go to, to work and they have to go through winter. I'm, I'm absolutely serious, get a motorcycle at that With point. With a sidecar. Look at this look he's giving me, what's that look? Yeah, because it's... I'm not making fun it, of no, you, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm honestly it's saying... It's unrealistic, that. there's plenty of families out there, Dad, that have a small amount of money and they have to take their kids yeah, to school. Oh, don't, don't... The Geo me. Metro is, a, is an option no, there. No, it's not, it's, it's dangerous and it's going to fail and it's going to break and it's going to make their life miserable. I really so, think... So I was kind of flippant, I said get it, but I would not recommend that car, good God. That, but Dad, at some point, I mean... There are much better cars in for $3,000. Not in this market is my point, especially if you want fuel efficiency. First of all, you're not going to find a Geo Metro. Well, you do. You can. They're out there. That's not true. They built a ton of them. Other one like that, Toyota Echo. You know, sure. Very yeah, reliable. Okay. Tercels, very reliable. How about, very good. How um, about, how about like, Toyota Yaris, same thing. How about a Scion IQ? Yeah, also, yeah, also no. To not well, Scion IQ. No, not Scion, uh, the uh, Toyota, what's the, what's the Toyota IQ? What was that one? This, the, the Scion the, IQ is a little smart car thing. It was a three-seater. Uh, yeah, don't get that. We want affordable and cheap. Because they're not affordable. I was just shopping for them. They're like, they're what, were, like what were those three seater Toyotas? The Scion that IQ. Was the, um, yeah, that was the Scion IQ. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but I, I wouldn't get one because okay. they're not that cheap. They're like 10 grand plus in this market. Um, I, Toyota, I would consider Toyota Yaris also a great. Look, here, here's the problem, Tommy. I, I understand you're trying to give good advice to people, right? Yeah. The problem is when you get into that like $3,000 range and yeah. you want to feel efficient, you're going so far back that the cars become, in my mind, dangerous, right? They will, they will fold around you in an accident like sure. an accordion. And then if they don't fold around you because they're so old and because the technology is so bad, you will probably have it, uh, you know, a total of 2.3 hours before the brakes go or before, mm -hmm. before the carburetor goes. You know, I just I wouldn't even look but at those But here's cars. the issue, Dad. I mean, this that would I would have agreed with you two years ago. But the market is so insane. Finding any running and driving car now that's going to be reliable for three so, grand. So at, if, at is, that point, oh. look, if you want to talk, have that, I'll be happy to have that conversation, right? Yeah. So uh, you can get, you may not get fuel efficient cars, right? But you can get cars that are safe and are inexpensive and are long lived, and you don't have to go down the Geo Metro route. The, the perfect example of that would be your Jeep Grand Cherokee that Nathan's now driving. Sure, mm -hmm. but those. 
but once again, the issue exactly is fuel efficient. they're so unfuel efficient where they're they're not in the but, reach for but some look, folks. How much is a day in the hospital going to cost you? Yeah, that yeah. I, I mean, it's, more than one day. And it, that and the Jeep is you know, it's got other upsides, right? Yeah, it's, it's not going to be reliable though. The four a three thousand dollar four point seven or straight six is an old Grand Cherokee will be cheap to fix. Right, the parts you can go to any auto advanced auto get parts for them. If this is your only car, I couldn't recommend. It, it a Grand also Cherokee. has all wheel drive. I just so it's good in the winter. I couldn't recommend a Grand Cherokee for an only car. I just I don't trust reliability. I trust them. I would if you're gonna get a car that that from that era, go Japanese. It's got to be that roundy era Camry, or it's got to be the the That's all wheel drive. I'm saying, but if you're at some point, the the budget is so low. I mean, if, if where the go, maintenance cost is going to be more important if, than the other drive. Wanna, if you want to go like Japanese, then do Forerunner. Too it's, expensive. But I'm saying compared to the right, that's the problem, right? Because the Japanese cars, because they have a reputation for being reliable, well, are going to be double the cost. Like, but if, are if, well deserved. Forerunner and a Grand Cherokee, right, are probably very similar in what they do and how they approach the world, but the Grand Cherokee is going to be half the cost. A well-deserved reputation. Yeah, I'm not saying it's not well-deserved. And I'm saying if you have $3,000 to spend, you're not going to get a good Grand Cherokee that's going to treat you well. It just won't happen. Because, I mean, if you get a ZJ, you have automatic transmission issues. If you get a newer one, you might be able to get the straight oh, six. But the buzzkill here. I just yeah. want to be realistic. <laughs> I think you, you will find a good ZJ. You but know, ZJs that, have the horrible okay. transmissions that are made out of glass. On. All right, so let's, let's if, if we're going down this road, let's, let's actually give some useful consumer advice instead of arguing. So first of all, I disagree. I think you can find an old Jeep Grand Cherokee that will be reliable. Here is what you have to look for, okay? When you're out there, because you go to Craigslist in Denver, put in Grand Cherokee, you're gonna get 3,000 of those things, right? Yeah. Now you gotta find the right one, right? You gotta find the single owner one, and the price difference between a single owner and one that's been kicked around between the auction sites is gonna be negligible. It's going to be negligible. So find the single owner one. Find the guy who who you like or gal who's got all the receipts for it, right? Find the one that's been driven uh, to work or cross country, and those do exist. So then it becomes about finding the right variant of the car. You're arguing. You're saying that every ZJ is going to have transmission problems. I'm saying yes. Every car is going to have issues at some point, and we know what those failure points are because they've built a lot of them. But because they've built a lot of them, because there are a lot of them out there, you can find ones that have been taken care of, that haven't been subject to deferred maintenance, that will be reliable, and they will cost the exact same amount that the crappy ones that will have those problems. Now you just have to be smart and you have to do your homework and you have to find the right car. I was just talking to Toby, a mechanic, about this because he deals in a lot of these affordable yes. cars. And he said in this market, Finding a running and driving car that will be reliable for three thousand is very tricky. All right. very I'm not, I'm not yeah, saying absolutely. it's not tricky. And it's I right. think that you are much more likely to have better luck with longevity on a Toyota product, a Nissan product from that era, than a Jeep. So I'm putting so, that out there. So look, there's there's certain cars that just have like a second life that are going to be expensive. So a four hundred in Colorado is one of those cars, right? Sure. People want them to go off roading. So if they have you know, a regular car, and then they need to go and go bash something out, they're going to get a foreigner. But you're right, there are like cars that don't have that second life. Another example of that might be a, to a less extent an Xterra. Xterras have yeah. very similar, but they don't necessarily are as sought after by people who go off roading. If you want to go further downfield, go with a Pathfinder. Sure. Right? Same, mm -hmm. same thing, right? They're not, and they're going to be a little bit less desirable because. Not as many people are looking for them. So, for example, um, I'm all about cheap Jeeps. I think they're great. But if it's your only car, you have to rely on every day to get you to... And, because I have a real-world example of this. We bought what we thought was a good Grand Cherokee. It was $2,500. And it had a lot of good, good things going for it. It was rust-free, clean interior. It had some service history to it. No head gasket issues with that 4.7. And it still needed a $2,000 transmission rebuilt. Yeah, I agree. But also, Tommy, you know, I said be smart about it. And when I bought that vehicle, uh, which I did, right, I bought that, uh, I was I was running into a pretty serious deadline in terms of video production. So I would have walked from that car. But even mm -hmm. if you didn't have that deadline in this uh, market, I would have walked. In this market, finding a WJ Grand Cherokee that's one owner for three grand is just not very realistic. It just isn't. You got like I say, you know, most people probably the people who probably are shopping for cars. Uh, in that price bracket, right. you know, are probably people who have their back against the wall, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you, like you're driving to work, and all of a sudden your car, like, explodes or sure. something, right? And you need a car to get to work, and so you go to your local used car lot, right? And the guy talks you into buying 
And Whatever. And it's going to be a guy for the most part into something, and that car is going to be from the auction, and it's going to have issues, right? So this advice I'm giving you uh, is grand if you have the time and the uh, right. and, and the ability to actually put the work in. And, and that's, that's, why, that's a lot of work. And that's why I'm saying if you are up against a wall, just buy a Toyota. Right. Just buy a Camry, buy an Echo, buy a Yaris, buy something that has a proven reliability record. Right. For an example, I'm just looking at old Yaris prices. Mm-hmm. You can get a 2009 Yaris two door yeah for just under 11 grand for an 09 yaris 09 yaris you gotta go older you gotta go like two. 40 that's forty seven thousand miles yeah that's that, that's I, i'm I, talking I, like I, before i do yaris it's a weird car i do a corolla yeah a corolla yeah absolutely do a corolla. You never but go wrong with a corolla. i'm just making the point that if you need an affordable reliable car with good fuel economy to get you places get a corolla get an old camry well, we've ca- certainly gone far afield, guys, from the original, uh, you know, area we started. But I think it's I think it's relevant because right now, you know, our economy is changing. I think people are feeling uh, a lot of pain out there, not just in gas prices, but with inflation. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of stuff isn't out there. So, so you know, I think we had a conversation for. Um, everybody in this podcast. So, you know, from people looking for $3,000 cars all the way to the to the people who are out there buying um, $50,000 allocation GT4 RSs. And hopefully it was not just uh, educational, but fun. Yeah, and let us know yeah. what you think in the comments below. Yep, thanks for watching. See you guys next time. Ciao.